Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. It's Tuesday 24th of March 2020 and just now the Indian government has apparently locked down the entire Indian population for 21 days. This is a population with a very large number of people uh, under 30. And so uh, I produced this presentation called Proposal for Demographically Driven SARS-CoV-2 Response, Working with Nature to Minimize Full Society Impacts. Okay, so I think everyone by now understands there is some really hard choices having to be made. Basically, the number of deaths uh, because of disease and also because of effects of current approaches, they're kind of like if you take people's income away, this could cause depression and cause death. But of course, there is very real deaths occurring because of the disease. There is disruption to education. And at the moment, we just don't know how long it's going to be here in the Czech Republic. They were saying uh, maybe we would have to wait till uh, next year, September, and maybe it would be extended from then. Um, with what's going on, as I'll show you in a minute, um, they're suggesting that maybe uh, children could go back to school in May, but then what happens if uh, there is a flare-up of the um, uh, virus again? Do kids then not go to school? I mean, it would be toing and froing uh, from school. A lot of uh, people have suggested quite rightly that there may be an impact to econ the economies around the world until we have essentially global herd immunity. And some people are saying this requires up to 80% uh, uh, of the population to be exposed. And that's basically if you have uh, someone infected over here and someone infected over here, until there's 80% of the population uh, exposed and recovered, you don't get the protection from people uh, in between this person that hasn't had it and has got it and this person over here. Uh, that has it, hasn't had it uh, uh, from infection. Uh, if you have a lot of people in between that have had it and uh, have recovered, then the person over here that hasn't had it uh, is unlikely to get it from the person over here uh, that's got it. So that's the point about having the herd immunity. Um, now, there's a re very real risk here that there could be possible food shortages uh, if vast numbers of the world uh, are not able to do their farming to the same degree. And uh, as you will see uh, from what's happened in various countries, uh, charity starts at home. So if there's only so much rice produced, there is only so much pulses produced, let's say in India, um, then, you know, they want to look after their own population first. So there may be bans on export. So one might rightly ask, is it time to plant a vegetable patch? Uh, this is a responsible thing that many people can do, which could be fun to do whilst they're stuck at home, for instance. And uh, a proper vaccine should be tested for correct amount of time. And this likely puts even something that might be developed now 18 months away from being something that you would probably accept having in your body. Um, and, and by 18 months from now, unless there's a desperate attempt to make sure there's no herd immunity, you know, it may, may already be past the point of use. For the majority of people. So there's some really hard choices being made and you can see for instance the British government having to struggle with this where they wanted to take a, a more let it work its way through approach to start with to actually locking down the whole population last night. Okay so the path one that's currently being taken it would seem is isolation and therapeutics. So for instance if we take the example of the Czech Republic which were very early movers on the isolation front where I am currently they have seen the cases dropping now if you look here this is up to March the 23rd so up to yesterday they've seen the cases dropping approximately two weeks after the increasing measures were brought in to slow the spread and this is using the data from the John Hopkins University and so over here we were starting to see the slow trend up and seeing what was coming out of Italy and the fact that a lot of the people coming to the country were you know infected in Italy there was a big move to introduce measures in the early part of the month but that didn't stop it still rising up and what looked like an exponential sort of curve here of new cases per day and so hopefully this trend downwards here is actually uh, due to the response that was taken by the Czech authorities of increasing severity in the early parts of the month. Then the other option in exclusion of a herd immunity which we don't have and properly tested vaccine which should be a very long way away is therapeutics and uh, 
from China, from South Korea, from Australia, from France, uh, and uh, from other jurisdictions, it would appear that uh, some combination of uh, forms of chloroquine, the, uh, either chloroquine uh, itself or hydroxychloroquine, and some antibiotics and or uh, uh, zinc uh, ions combine to uh, give some favorable outcomes. And there are many papers published on this. I've, I've link, uh, given two links down here. But uh, on uh, Hannity, which is, is the uh, is a uh, current affairs uh, news program in the U.S. at prime time, uh, and is the most popular, it would it would appear from the ratings uh, in the U.S. Uh, prime time news program. Uh, Sean Hannity read to his four to five million nightly viewers live on TV and to the US Vice President a letter that was uh, he claimed was supplied to him by a New York doctor who had treated, along with his colleagues, around about 500 patients in total in various New York areas with this regimen of therapeutics, the chloroquine, the azithromycin and zinc sulfate. And he said live on air, to millions and millions of people and the vice president that this had resulted in zero deaths, zero hospitalizations, and zero intubations. So this is very encouraging, but this isn't a reason to go out and self-medicate. This was a doctor and doctors doing this uh, based on understanding the medical history of the individuals involved and their status in the progression of this disease. The hydroxychloroquine acts in a number of ways, it would seem from these various papers and other papers that are out there to prevent the virus from replicating so much. Uh, the azithromycin is to deal with bacteria that are opportunistic. So when your body has attacked the lung tissue as a result of the infection with the virus and it gets compromised, the bacteria that is in there or, or in the environment often can get a foothold. And this is really what starts the rapid downward spiral in patients, according to many of the studies. So that is to deal with the opportunistic bacteria. And the zinc sulfate uh, works with the uh, hydroxychloroquine in that the hydroxychloroquine apparently allows the zinc ions into the cell. And in the cell, it, it uh, slows down the ability of the virus to be replicated within the cell. And so this gives you multiple ways that the body can use its own immune system to get uh, the upper hand on the virus and reduce the rate of replication of the virus within the body. There's very good reasons why these outcomes should have occurred with this protocol. And so it's isolation and therapeutics which uh, essentially are being used across the world right now. Now, there are demographic challenges. As I said before, 80% must, it would seem, be exposed to this, i.e. they must get it to get a herd immunity. And so, you know, we, we have the situation um, where obviously it would be no one has it practically. Uh, and if anyone has children at school, um, and uh, I know I do, kids are a huge pathogen vector. And they are actually in many cultures, for instance, like in India, they are looked after by grandparents in those cultures uh, when not at school. But the children are, it would seem, as I'll talk about later, ex extremely low risk for this pathogen. Now, typically in a winter season, I, I would get two or three colds or coughs or, or flu or whatever off my children because they're going to school mixing with, you know, 100 other children who all have parents and the parents are all exposed to other people. So whatever is available in the, in the environment goes through the children back to the families. So it, it, the first thing that a lot of communities and countries around the world have done is to close schools to prevent this sort of rapid spreading of the virus. But because the elderly are mostly the ones at risk, it would seem from all of the data, uh, you can't park the children who are not at school with the elderly. You have to find some way to care for them. So in some countries, they've ke kept schools open for uh, key workers like in Australia and in the UK, so that the doctors and so on can, can go and care for the sick. But for those that aren't in that position, people had to stop work to look after their children because, uh, you know, what other choice did they have? And so this precipitates the economy shutting down. And if you're not getting any money, how can you properly look after your kids? And, and so everything starts to kind of fall apart in society. 
And so many countries have closed the society down. The biggest example of that, the whole of India today. Uh, and there's no real clear exit strategy. As I said before, you know, let's f say, for instance, in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, the Czech Republic decide they've got, got a handle of this. All of the people that are infected are, are being monitored and in isolation and so forth. And they let all the kids go back to school and, and, and open, reopen the borders. Well, we don't have herd immunity. And so, you know, a few more cases and, and it can go quickly in a couple of weeks from here up to, you know, 50, 100 a day again. And so then we have to close it down. So potentially this kind of approach with isolation and therapeutics may be a stop-start thing. And that's just going to kill confidence in business and so forth. So, And also there are economic and legal risks going on. By that I mean... Um, <laughs> Businesses have shut, okay? So in some cases, their income has gone to zero. For instance, in the hospitality sector, you know, if you've not got people in your hotel rooms or you've not got people going to your swimming pool, basically the income is zero. And you have to look to make casual workers or people that you have low risk from penalties. You have to make them unemployed. And so you've got chefs out of work, teachers doing nothing. Also worryingly is that it would seem that in uh, many countries, new draconian laws are being enacted. Uh, and, you know, we've got experience from the early 2000s where new laws come in and they persist after the immediate threat of whatever's going on passes. It's like there's a smorgasbord, a, a kind of wish list of things that you want to get past. And whilst any, everyone's panicking and looking the other way and worrying about their families and how they're going to feed themselves and whether their business is going to fail, you can get these laws through. So the, the cure here might be worse than the disease. You know, no one wants anyone to die but if our lives are forever altered and our freedoms are restricted and because they've used this opportunity to p pass these things under the radar, so to speak, you know, uh, we've got we to gotta be careful about these things. So we need to pay attention to what's going on. So let's look at what's actually happened in the data out there. So I've given this link here to uh, this doctor that reported this data out of the Chinese situation. And they've got several tens of thousands of people here in this study and the fatality percentage here. And what you can see from this is the vast majority of deaths over the people that were actually in care and, and, and their, their, uh, their, their disease progress monitored were over 50. And many of the infected under 50 may not have sought care um, uh, as they may have been asymptomatic. So what I'm saying is you know, it, there were so few people, even of those that were monitored and, and established to have had the disease, that actually had a, a serious, a, a, you know, serious as in died uh, outcome. Um, that the people in this group, there may have been a vast amount of people that uh, were basically asymptomatic. Uh, so the fatality rate in this this group here may actually be extremely low compared to what is even recorded out of the ones that were being monitored. And then many of the people at this end, in the older groups, and in fact at all ages, um, they could have died because of other risk factors. And, and so, you know, uh, those are the people that you really need to think about when trying to protect parts of society. And additionally, there was, uh, when the Chinese were, were suffering this earlier on, there was a lack of understanding of the risk ages. I mean, it's out of this data that we can see that the elderly are at risk. And uh, additionally, uh, the, a lot of this data includes people um, that uh, died because there was no viable treatment regimes, as there seem to be possibly uh, emerging out of research done now in multiple countries. So the, the, the picture here that you're seeing is you know, what happened in, in the first mover uh, situation. Now, if we look at the Italian data, and this is uh, published again, I've given the link down here, but this is looking at 22,512 cases, so it's, it's not anywhere near as much as the Chinese data, and it's following up to the, um, the 15th of March, so, you know, this is uh, a week or a bit ago uh, from now. Uh, and the deaths at that point were 1,625. Now, it's been really horrendous what's happened in Italy since then. However, up to this point, there had been zero deaths below the age of 30. 
So this actually is quite similar to the data here we're seeing from China. Now, uh, some of the treatment regimes I was pointing to at the top here, this use of hydroxychloroquine uh, has been recently uh, approved for use in Italy. So certainly it would appear that if it wasn't being used in Italy uh, prior to last week in any real sense, then this is the kind of outcomes that you would get if that wasn't being applied. That needs to be verified. But what we can say is apparently up to even yesterday that only one child in the world had died under the age of 15. Okay, so these are things that one needs to consider uh, when considering if there's any other options and, and ways forward which would give us uh, potential exit strategies which we can actually plan for. So if there was a deliberate thrust for herd immunity, you know, for instance, if you took the Chinese data here, which I showed on a previous slide, and we assume that this is our entire population, our entire population, okay, and we then uh, put them in, on an island somewhere, and we had all of the medications that were available to these Chinese people and, you know, uh, equipment uh, that were available to these Chinese people, and then deliberately if exposed 80% of those population to give that group herd immunity, you would end up, if you did it for the 0 to 39-year-old, you would end up by actually saving the lives of four people. Okay? So if you let let all of them get it, which they did, then you, you lose what you lo lost. But if, if you uh, had them exposed to it, uh, with everything else being the same, and to give them herd immunity in this, for instance, 0 to 39 age group, you would end up with saving four lives. Anyway, so th that's just something to think about. Um, and uh, the, the point is, is that we may need 60, 70, 80% uh, or it may actually happen that before a properly tested um, vaccine is available that you will need 60 70 80 percent of the population to have had the condition and and recovered from it in order to do that herd immunity so what the uk government did on sunday just two days ago before they imposed the the full uh, clampdown was they were looking to isolate the most at risk and you know i was thinking that this probably is the right approach because almost all of the deaths are in this older uh, uh, group here uh, and it even skewed to the 60 and above so you know these people really need to be the ones that are staying at home and and being really really protected by society so is there a rationale for you know now that there are potential therapeutics could you say that if you deliberately expose the 0 to 39-year-old group, that given the fact that you know that their condition would be SARS-CoV-2, given that you know it, you're not trying to have to wait for a test to come back before you treat them. You're just looking at the ones, the, the very few that progress to a more serious state of the disease or just start on that, and then you, you, you hit them with the regimes, uh, the, the therapeutic uh, protocols that have been established in various countries now, would you even see anything close to the 80% case of just being exposed in the next two, three years to uh, the virus as it slow burnt through the uh, you know, community? Would you actually have less people in this 0 to 39 group? And so knowing that it is CV, you can use best practice therapeutics. And so potentially you would end up with far, far less deaths. And uh, what you can say is that all of those that are recovered are no threat to the rest because they, uh, you know, they, they've already had it and they can't get it. So they can't be shedding virus particles. And so they could actually provide life-saving plasma uh, you know, from that group of the zero to 39 year old to those that are outside of that group. So, you know, uh, this is, like I say, if, if, if this looks like it's failing, do we have to look at a different approach? You know, if, if we're good, doing this isolation and therapeutics and we have no viable vaccine, how do we get to a point of having an exit strategy? Could we do something like this. So this is a proposal in the event that path one fails. So the at risk are to be identified and to self-isolate as per the UK approach on the 22nd of March uh, 2020. 
So they really need to be protected. They are at the most risk. Now, the 0 to 39 age group, including not at risk parents, they could perhaps volunteer to stay in the currently shuttered hotels and fed and watered by the, the entertainment industry, which is currently uh, not able to operate properly. So, so basically, you know, have a, a kind of like a holiday camp in a kind of like, it's very difficult to talk about this without it seeming a bit weird. And I'm sure people will get back very upset. But the point is, you know, we have to think a little bit radically. So if we take the 0 to uh, 29 age group and, and we assume that, you know, the, the Italian data when they didn't have the advantage of these new therapeutic regimes is true. And, and, and in, in this period that of the 22,512 that got infected, zero people died in that age group. Well, then would it be good for people to volunteer to be deliberately exposed and then treated in the best way? And if they did that... And in fact, if all 0 to 39-year-olds participated in, say, for instance, in New York or whatever, then the education and broader economy that involved those people, like the students and the school children, that economy could restart and people wouldn't be losing their education. And you would know those people are not at risk to the elderly. So, you know, out of school, they could go and stay with the elderly and help them because, you know, as long as they do their personal hygiene they're not able to shed virus and so they can help the vulnerable um, without virus shedding and then lastly they can actually provide plasma uh, to uh, those uh, you know that are at high risk and also for frontline staff like doctors emergency workers policemen and so forth so you would have a situation where the future really is the young. In fact, they can, uh, you know, help build up this herd immunity. You know, and and if you work through the age groups and you have a lot of plasma available uh, to help treat the the the, the more at risk, then you know when these higher risk uh, age groups um, get exposed to the disease. Uh, whence you, you kind of say, okay, this is our exit, we're going to go back to work. You then have the, the tested therapeutics and you have a lot of plasma uh, that can help deal with the slow burn uh, in the wider community later down the line. So there it is. Uh, what I'm essentially saying is right now the world is going for isolation and whatever therapeutics appear to be doing the best job. We are not uh, likely to get a viable vaccine uh, for 18 months, certainly something that people would consider putting in their bodies. And uh, we do need uh, this kind of 80% or 70 or 80% to be exposed, and we need an exit strategy. So the governments could support the the hotel industry and the, the catering industry and the entertainment industry to, to make it a really pleasant time. I mean, if, if for instance, my children had been exposed uh you know three weeks ago they would already be likely clear of the disease and not be a threat to any old people <laughs> you know what i'm saying already by now because you know we've been isolated and not at school for well over two weeks now um and and so this is my proposal uh, i'm i'm putting it out there i'm not suggesting any governments do this i'm just putting it out for consideration and for people to think about so thank you very much for your time the martin fleischmann memorial project is a project that is looking into low energy nuclear reactions to solve the energy problem and the problem of nuclear waste so thank you very much for your time